Hi, this week we'll be taking a quick look at the Orange Pi 2 Plus. I managed to get in a lot of my tests before my uh, accident. Ah, nice. Okay, let's power this up. I am the magic smoke genie. What? I am the magic smoke genie. You've released me from my prison. Prison? Released? Yes, I will grant you two. No, three wishes. Three wishes? Really? Yes. So you expect me to believe a so-called sentient being is trapped inside a voltage regulator and can't get out? Uh, yes! So, what have you been doing all this time? Oh, uh, stuff. Stuff? Really? Oh, this isn't really going that well. No, not really. Okay, how about you grant me my first wish? How about I go back in time and stop myself from doing this? Uh, you're sure? Yep, I'm sure. Okay. Ah, nice. Okay, let's power this up. Oh, bugger, not again. Later on you'll get to see my stupidity, but for now, here's the Orange Pi 2 Plus with magic smoke safely contained in the semiconductors. All of the Orange Pi models are a bit difficult to figure out, but you can check my website for a list of differences between all the models. Most of the Orange Pies are based on the all-winner H3 quad-core Cortex-A7 and run at 1.6 GHz, except for the cheaper models. The Orange Pi 2 Plus, 2E, have 2 gigs of RAM, while all the others have 1 gig RAM, and the cheaper models have either 512 or 256 megs. The 2 Plus and 2E also have 16 gig onboard eMMC, the only other model, the Pi Plus, with 8 gigs eMMC. <sighs> OK, just check out my website. So here we have it. Starting from the top right, working clockwise, we have two USB 2.0 ports, gigabit Ethernet, another two USB 2.0 ports, infrared, SD slot, almost standard Pi header, upgrade button, recovery button, TTL UART for console, power button, 5 volt 2 amp DC power jack, TRRS audio and video out, mic, HDMI, camera interface, not MIPI CSI, SATA power, SATA 2.0, USB OTG, then there's the Realtek 8189 Wi-Fi, Realtek 8211 Ethernet, 16 gig EMC with pre-installed Android OS, 2 gigs RAM, and the all-winner H3. On the flip side, we have, oh, just the SATA chip, which is based off the Genesis Logic GL830. That's pretty much the whole board. So first of all, I wanted to test out a Linux-based OS running off the SD card. I had the same issues in finding the official Orange Pi 2 Plus OS image. If you're starting from scratch, you can follow the Orange Pi 2 quick start guide, as it's almost the same. If you look at the wiki, it has links to a range of distributions like Raspbian, oh, okay, forget that, Android, which looks promising, and then there's this downloads link. This takes you to a completely different area with different download links, compared to the drop-down menu. That's really strange. They really need to fix this up. So, I was interested in testing out Android, Raspbian, and plain old Debian 8. Of course, if you want an OS that just works, I would strongly suggest fetching Ambien. I downloaded the current Debian Jesse as well as Ubuntu Xenial. First up, I loaded Ambien Jesse to an SD card, then chucked it in along with the usual Ethernet, keyboard and mouse, HDMI, and finally the juice. Once the juice was on, it settled down to around a 600 milliamp current draw. The odd thing was that I didn't see any HDMI output. I was using an Elgato HD60, which is capable of capturing up to 1080p at 60Hz. Logging in via SSH gives you the usual first login Ambien config, but I wanted to get the HDMI going, so I played around with the display settings using a number of options, but never could really get it going. Not even direct connecting to my monitor. Strange. For those interested, the Ambien OS takes around 40 seconds to reboot, which is fairly decent. I'm sure it could be optimised though. Once up and running, you can see the four cores available, and the use of tempfs for transient file systems is a must for an OS running on SD. Running LSUSB shows up the Genesis Logic SATA controller is actually a USB 2.0 to SATA bridge, so I'm not going to expect blazing fast performance on SATA. Genesis Logic's product guide confirms this as well. 
Oh by the way, if you're ever going to use any pre-installed Debian distro, then make sure you set your time zone correctly. It's a very simple step and fixes a lot of issues. For all my testing, I have a reasonably fast 3.5 inch SATA disk attached to a USB 3 bridge, which of course is going to be slowed down by the USB 2.0 bus on the Pi Plus 2. It came up and I mounted it without issue. So first up, some simple tests. If you want to use the onboard mic, make sure that you set the input device correctly. I just used Alsa Mixer for this. If you compare my studio microphone to the onboard mic, you can hear that it's pretty decent for a small condenser. What about the serial console? I used a cheap logic probe to check on the output. Sent some random text out to the dev TTY S0, and yep, I expected this to work as there's not much to it. The onboard infrared also worked without issue. And you also have access to the onboard green and red LEDs. If you watched my Orange Pi Zero review, you would have noticed the plethora of GPIOs available on the H2 or winner. The H3 is pretty much the same. Shame the company didn't just push out a bunch more of these. Anyway, basic GPIO access works without issue. However, you have to be careful how the pins are named. My script, which is available on GitHub, translates Orange Pi GPI names to slash sys pin numbers. This seems to have become a real issue with SBCs these days. The GPIO names are very different to that on the Pi. This just becomes a pain in the neck for software. So onto some I2C tests. I installed the missing I2C utils package, which allowed me to scan the two buses. Then I attached my trusty MCP9808 temperature sensor, which appeared on the bus and I was getting temperature readings without issue. Next on to SPI tests. I can't really use my Max7219 for this test because the Orange Pi works on 3.3 volt logic levels. And if you check the Max7219 datasheet, you'll see the minimum voltage for a logic one is 3.5 volts. So nope, it's not gonna work. So I used an ILI9341 based LCD screen but I had some really mixed results with this. I managed to get it going with the FBTFT kernel driver. It could see it, and I could write random data directly to the screen. But every so often, the device would hang and be completely unresponsive. I know that some people have managed to get this LCD going. Unfortunately, the magic smoke genie put a stop to me going back to analyze this further. Onto some thermal tests. I installed RPI monitor to log temperature while I ran my initial tests. It's a pretty good package. It even has a fab web interface. Oh, okay, sorry, that's such a 60s term. I could have said the interface is snatched, sis. Just sit back, boots. But no, nah, then I'd be extra. So, <coughs> anyway. My initial run of Pharonix tests showed up some interesting results. My first lot of tests I usually do on the stock board and later add heat sinks and retest. As you can see, a lot of the results were pretty poor, sitting somewhere around the Raspberry Pi 2 level, as the CPU was being throttled back to around 1.2 GHz or lower. Some of the later tests are more heavy on I.O., as they were testing out how long it took to compile Apache and PHP. They all performed poorly, mainly in part to the CPU throttling, but also due to the fairly slow USB 2 I.O. The temperature stayed fairly constant throughout, with a minimum of 45 degrees C, max of 81, average of 68, and a median of 76. So it can only improve with heat sinks. What about the network side? We have gigabit ethernet, can it keep up? UDP jitter was pretty low and to be expected from any gigabit device. And TCP throughput was up there with any average device. Moving over to Wi-Fi was fairly trivial. The Realtek driver is pretty solid these days and I was able to connect without issue and I saw a decent result with a low UDP jitter and fairly high TCP throughput. Using a better aerial didn't see the results change much, so the default aerial is pretty good for most applications. Next on to some SATA testing. I used a standard 120 gig 2.5 inch Toshiba hard disk. Note that you can't use a 3.5 inch disk as that requires an additional 12 volt supply. Once attached, it appeared as device SDA. Oh, while I'm here, you'll notice that the onboard EMMC came up with a bunch of petitions, which I'm assuming is a pre-install of Android. But once again, damn the magic smoke genie. Current draw went up to around 800 milliamps with a disk attached and sitting idle, and almost hit 1 amps when I was creating the file system. But then trouble set in. During my Pharonix load test, the disk would vanish from the USB. I double-checked the voltage coming out of the SATA power header, which I thought was a little on the low side. So since I had a long power cable, I needed to accommodate, so I cranked up the voltage on my bench power supply to 5.15 volts. Easy enough to do, eh? Except Doofus here should really have set the voltage with everything disconnected. Ah! Crap! Whew! 
Well, that's fun. Look at that. Magic smoke. Fantastic. Well, let's see what the damage is. So what did I actually do to the board? Well, the first things to get hit are the voltage regulators, as they are the first non-passive component. First U20 went poof, and U24 one-upped with a spectacular display. Not wanting to miss out on the fun, U7 decided to hit the big time. Then U4 kicked in with a bit of action, along with a bit more one-upping from U20 and U24. And then, just as the party started to get going, they all just stood there looking embarrassed at each other. Since I applied three times the input voltage and the regulators were flaring for a while, it's highly likely the whole board is stuffed. I could possibly go around and replace all the regulators and fix it, but it'll be forever dodgy. I have no idea whether or not a transient 15 volts would have made it to the MCU, which would have killed it completely. Once I get my replacement board, I'll be running through all the tests I missed out on. I thought that the Pi 2 was a pretty decent board for the price. There's the usual overheating issues that I saw the board perform poorly, but a proper heatsink would see it beat the Orange Pi Zero and the Raspberry Pi 3. As for software, heck, just go with Ambient and save yourself the hassle. So, thanks for watching. See you next week.